I'm John Berman with Brianna Keeler. Good morning to our viewers here in the United States and all around the world. It is Thursday, July 15th, and we begin with explosive revelations about just how close American democracy came to the edge. Jaw dropping, dropping excerpts from a new book about the aftermath of the 2020 election. And these excerpts obtained by CNN's Jamie Gangel are from this upcoming book, I Alone Can Fix It, by two Pulitzer Prize winning Washington Post reporters. Among the revelations, America's top generals feared that then-President Trump would attempt a coup after the election, and they planned ways to stop him. This was the first time in modern U.S. history that there was a potential showdown between the commander-in-chief and the military. General Mark Milley and the other Joint Chiefs plotted mass resignations one by one rather than carry out orders from Trump that they consider to be illegal, something of a reverse Saturday night massacre. According to the book, General Milley also viewed Trump as an authoritarian leader. And as for the big lie, Milley told his aides it was, quote, the gospel of the Fuhrer. And in another scene in the book, General Milley publicly confronts the White House chief of staff during an Army-Navy football game and grilled Mark Meadows about whether Trump would fire FBI Director Chris Wray and CIA Director Gina Haspel. And the book also claims that Milley and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo met privately and Pompeo told Milley that the, quote, crazies are taking over, which is an account that Pompeo denies. The book also describes tense moments that played out during January 6th and the aftermath, including Liz Cheney telling Jim Jordan during the Capitol riot, quote, you effing did this. And House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's fear is that Trump would use a nuclear weapon during his final days in office. The book describes a private conversation she had with General Milley, and he reassured Pelosi that the military would not carry out an order that was illegal. And then finally, the book talks about Trump's disdain for German Chancellor Angela Merkel during an Oval Office meeting about NATO and Germany, where according to the book, Trump refers to the German Chancellor as, quote, that bitch Merkel. All right, I want to bring in CNN Pentagon correspondent Barbara Starr and CNN political analyst and Washington correspondent for the New York Times, Maggie Haberman. And Barbara, just one more specific excerpt here I want to read you because this really does tell the story about what was going on in Milley's head. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs genuinely worried about the possibility of a coup. Uh, he says, they may try, but they're not going to effing succeed, he told them. You can't do this without the military. You can't do this without the CIA and the FBI. We are the guys with the guns. To hear the chairman of the Joint Chiefs talk about contingency planning for a coup, it's pretty stunning, Barbara. It it is. It is jaw-dropping. There's no other way around it. They may be the guys with the guns, but Millie was going to make darn sure that those guns were not used. What we saw, uh, I, I think, from the time of the killing of George Floyd through the summer of protests into the election and after the election, was Mark Milley uh, begin to be far beyond the traditional portfolio of a chairman of the Joint Chiefs. That's the president's chief military advisor. Milley was compelled to begin to track political developments in the country, and he's adamantly, adamantly stay, someone who stays out of partisan politics. He was tracking the protests. He very strongly believed that the U.S. military should not be called out on the streets against protesters, that this was a matter for civilian law enforcement. He wanted no part of it, something he was tracking literally day by day. And this whole notion of resigning, to understand Mark Milley, you must start with understanding he's a constitutionalist. He is someone who very strongly, uh, more than anybody, uh, believes in the Constitution. And that means military, the military will not follow orders that are illegal, immoral, not proportionate. Uh, they just won't do it. And he took a stand. You can remember that he started giving speeches where he talked about, never mentioning Trump, that the U.S. military follows not a person, but the Constitution. He was signaling constantly that he wouldn't have any part of it. And Maggie, this happens, this revelation, these revelations, as there has been a whitewashing of what happened on January 6th by Trump supporters. So this is giving us insight into how Milley, saw this to be so extreme of a situation in the months preceding the insurrection and obviously the day of the insurrection. 
I think, Brianna, I don't think this is just pegged to the insurrection. I think the insurrection, frankly, was the end of Millie's concerns, at least based on my own reporting. This, as Barbara said, it began. It, there was an intensity that began after June 1st, after the Lafayette Square mess and what we saw. But you had this sort of triumvirate of Bill Barr, the attorney general, Mark Esper, the defense secretary, and Mark Milley, who were countering what Trump wanted throughout the summer, which was to use the Insurrection Act in some form against, which would be deploying active military on the streets of the U.S. to try to tamp down protests. They were all three of them very concerned about this. So this went on for a very long time. And then one by one, you had Esper and Barr disappear. Esper got fired. Barr, by mid-December, simply could not take it anymore and, and resigned and I think had told associates that Trump seemed different and after the election acted as if he had nothing to lose. The backdrop for that was that, plus the fact that there was this meeting I reported on in real time on December 18th in the Oval Office where former uh, Lieutenant General Flynn and former National Security Advisor Flynn was presenting this notion to the president in the Oval Office about possibly using the apparatus of government to rerun an election. So Milley had reasons to be afraid, and suddenly, after having this triumvirate with him, Milley was alone. So I think it is not just the context of January 6th and the retrospective. I think it, there were a lot of events leading up to it that made him very concerned and then made him isolated in the face of what he feared Trump could do. I gotta say, that's fascinating. He was scared and he was alone. And Maggie, there's one other point that I think you make that is so important right now. This, this isn't some history lesson. This isn't something, you know, we read in an encyclopedia now. This is a story about someone who is the current front runner for the Republican nomination for president. Right. right? That's right. I think people are losing the, the fact this is not historical esoterica or, or just an, an effort to, to look at what happened for a book. This is talking about everything in the context of somebody who still has a very firm grip on the Republican Party. I realize there are some Republicans who get upset and think that we are overstating his control. We're not. Look at the events that are taking place. Look at every poll that shows him. Even if he doesn't have a commanding lead, he doesn't have the 80 percent you know, who want him to run for president again or want him to be the nominee, it's something like 55 percent. That's a lot of people. He doesn't have to do what other people running for president would have to do. He could keep this open up until early 2024 and not say what he's doing. So his footprint on American politics is huge. And so understanding how he governed is really important as we are looking at the next election. Millie, Barbara, essentially predicted this endpoint, as Maggie puts it, the insurrection. He talks about brown shirts, which of course were militias who served the Nazis, as if they are the Proud Boys, as if they are the extremists who supported Donald Trump. You know, uh, taking I, I, I take the point that everything in this book uh, thoroughly reported out, and so let me start from the proposition that it's all true. It is extraordinary that General Milley would reference anything related to Nazis. This is a subject, you know, let's be very blunt, decades and decades after World War II that is extraordinarily sensitive. U.S. military personnel do not use Nazi uh, uh, terminology. That to me shows how dire he felt it was that he had. He's a very plain spoken person. Anybody who knows him uh, will chuckle at just how plain spoken he can be. But this it should be a massive indicator. This type of language from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs should be a massive indicator of the level to which he was personally, professionally disturbed by what he saw. And I think what Milley, as much as he was beyond the traditional portfolio of a chairman because he had to be in his view, uh, what he also saw at that time, I can tell you, is that his job was to do everything to stop it from going over the edge. That is really what his goal was, to be present. He didn't travel out of town. He stayed close to Washington, close to the White House, close to all the key personnel that he was talking to. He had his finger on the pulse. He was constantly reading the room, so to speak. And he wanted to make sure that nothing tripped over that edge. He put himself out there, not a traditional role, something that uh, I, I think even General Milley would probably say should not have happened. This is not the job of the U.S. military, 
But at that time, with nobody else around, uh, Millie is someone who had the influence, the power, someone who was being listened to by key people, and especially listened to by people by Na like Nancy Pelosi, uh, who was calling over to the Pentagon not infrequently uh, to try and get her sense of what was going on. Not the things that we see happen around here every day. Let's remember, Mark Milley, Trump appointee as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, also here, which is not insignificant. Listen, Barbara, thank you. Maggie, stick around. We're going to have more revelations, including why Liz Cheney slapped Jim Jordan's hand and what Millie told Nancy Pelosi over her fears that the former president would fire nuclear weapons in his final days.